Hi, it's me again. I recently had an opportunity to interview a couple of guys that uh, have been become important to the project as we restore it. One of them I've talked about before is Jonathan Claiborne. He is the Invader Historical Society, and he has all kinds of records pertaining to A-26s. His grandfather was a pilot of an A-26, and uh, knowing that, he fell in love with them, and he's trying to find out everything he can about A-26s. The other one is Matt Cooper. You might ask who Matt Cooper is. Well, Matt Cooper is the son of, uh, of a man that bought the airplane in September of 1990, Dick Cooper, who unfortunately shortly thereafter uh, perished and the family couldn't support the project and it went on to other hands and eventually got to us. It was an interesting interview for me. I learned quite a few things that I didn't already know. Um, and uh, uh, I hope that you enjoy the video. Uh, please like, share, um, and leave comments. I'm real curious to what you think about this. So uh, I'll, with no further ado, we'll start the interview. Matt Cooper is the son of Dick Cooper, who purchased our aircraft in uh, sometime between May and September of 1990. Jonathan, why don't you talk about what you know as far as the history of when the aircraft was born up until the 90s when yeah, Cooper's got um, it? Let me, let me access my records here on the phone so I can get that right for you. So I have a couple different records. I've got some records from Douglas that have the actual date that it came off the line. And then I also have the Air, the U.S. Army Air Corps inventory record cards. And for those planes, for your plane and the planes before and after it in that block, by that point, they had canceled the contract. And so some of them just say like contract canceled. They didn't even finish. Most of the rest of them, the plane was finished, but not accepted by the Air Force. And they flew it from um, from the factory directly to Kingman, to the storage facility there. And so that's the date that's listed on the card is the date that it flew to Kingman. And so that was what was causing some of the confusion that was there early on was people are reading the record card and they're seeing the date and they're like, well, that's the date that it left the factory. But that's not true. They just kind of rolled them off the line and parked them on the tarmac off to the side and let them sit. And then they pulled them in random order to ship them to Kingman over the course of two months. Were they serialized? Yeah, they were serialized. And was that out of El Segundo or out of uh, Long Beach? Um, I'm checking on that. It should have been out of Long Beach. I just, I'm looking at my spreadsheet that I put together here, just looking at serial numbers 4434677 or seven, six, seven, through 778. Those were all produced in sequence off the factory line, but then they were shipped to Kingman in random order everywhere from the 14th of August, 1945 until December 13th, 1945. So a several months span, they would just grab one and throw some pilots in it and take it to Kingman. And then a couple of weeks later, grab another one and ship it to Kingman. Uh -huh. And some of the record cards will have the, like the serial number that it was at in Kingman. So let me look up your plane in particular and see if that's listed on the card. Uh, it says never delivered to Army Air Force contract terminated. Yeah, delivered direct to the facility from the factory, and then it lists the serial number and the ship date from the factory to Kingman is the thirty first of October, nineteen forty five. Okay, and then it says ship ticket number four six one six Kingman, Arizona. Okay, so when it got to Kingman, that was the inventory number of the plane in the facility there. To add to that, I, I heard from the pilot that uh, flew for Standard. He said that uh, the the history he had from it had eight hours total time when it went Sounds about through, right. when they when it landed in Kingman. 
And that time was just, uh, they had to put that time on it according to the contract to clear up any squawks it had. Yeah, the, that, uh, that sounds right to me. The, the, um, the government wasn't gonna pay Douglas until the airplane was flyable. That's what I heard it. If, if they wanted to get paid, it had to be finished, even though the war was over. Correct. Yeah, and so like, I'm not sure at what point in the assembly line production they they made the determination like this this particular airframe isn't it's not complete enough to bother finishing, versus where at some point down the assembly line they're like yeah we'll go ahead and finish the rest of these out. I don't know where they made that delineation at, um, but I would imagine that some of them were started and then never completed. But the ones that were completed on the records show very clearly that they were shipped to Kingman. And then ones that weren't done, say contract canceled, and then there's no other data on there, no no dates, no transfer, nothing. Are those presumably the ones that went to uh, Onmark or Rock, Rock, whoever to modify for uh, transport? <laughs> Some of that last block, like I know at least one of them served with uh, air spray up in Canada for a while. And then another one is currently still existing as a museum plane in Manitoba, Canada. And it's wearing like a, a fictitious invader paint scheme that like Canada never flew invaders. And so whatever paint scheme they have on it, it's not like a real invader paint scheme, but it looks cool. Presumably um, ours is the very last one out there the, the the newest airframe from flying the one in manitoba is newer than yours right but it's not flying correct right. at least not as far as i know it's just a static yeah. display right so uh matt tell us who these people are so these were friends of my father glenn and wanda courtright and they must have been passing through rockford illinois when we were back there in may of 1990 looking at the aircraft and they had Still restored home. a norden norseman we still have that table. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> and we still have, we this still have the thermos different. bottle set up. I don't know where the upper door is, but we still have the the thermoses and the Dixie cup dispenser. Mm -hmm. Now oh, there's a familiar oh, face. Yeah. Who's that? Oh, I'm a young kid. Getting your first oh, taste of right. aviation. That's right. So this was bolted down. So uh, why did your folks decide that this was a good idea? Because it's never a good idea. It was. It was probably not a good idea. <laughs> uh, my my dad grew up in Southern California. He was actually born in Glendale, California, um, in nineteen forty three, I believe, and just was always interested in aviation. He started flying as a college kid, got his private license over the years, uh, and he was oh, a flight man. test engineer at Boeing. And when I started getting interested in aviation, it really kind of relit his fire. So yeah, so my dad uh, was just always interested in, in warbirds. He was a flight test engineer at Boeing. I started getting really interested in aviation as a young kid. It was always a topic of conversation at our house. And when I was, I don't know, probably about 13 or so, I really really was interested in, and he, it kind of relit his fire. He'd always, always been following warbirds and, you know, we always had air classics magazines at home <laughs> and whatnot. And so I think he just decided if he was ever going to do it, now was the time. And so he just started tracking warbirds in general through trade plane for a year or so uh, with a spreadsheet and just watching and, you know, all of this stuff was way over his head. He was a, a low time private pilot. He didn't have any, any uh, reason to have an airplane like this, but <laughs> he liked it. It was cool and it was relatively affordable. I mean, per per pound, it was it was it was a great deal. But uh, you know, it was not the kind of airplane that that one guy really, with no maintenance or significant pilot experience, really had any responsibility owning. But he was a dreamer. Can I? Can I? Ask you, do you recall what he purchased it for? I'm just real curious. Yeah, seventy five thousand. Wow. And that was and that was ferry ferry ready for seventy five thousand. Well, there's your pa. Yeah. 
and had it ferried from Rockford, Illinois to Everett, Washington in September of 1990. I was 14 years old and got to tag along on the ferry flight. Okay. Um, and since then, uh, you've had conversations with Dave about the progress about of the airplane. And tell us about your life since you've become an uh, airline captain. Yeah. Cur currently flying for Alaska Airlines. Correct. Yeah. Hope to be there until I retire. Uh, yeah. I'm very passionate about uh, old vintage aircraft. And I've gotten to have a couple of jobs flying old vintage aircraft. Flew De Havilland Beavers on floats, flew Beach 18s on wheels hauling freight. Uh, and then kind of segued into my airline career, flew, the, flew for the commuters. And now I've been at Alaska Airlines for 17 years. Oh, good for you. Good for you. Well, so uh, tell me uh, your recollections about flying in the A-26. Your, your father obviously had uh, big hopes and dreams for this airplane at the time. And unfortunately, he he unfortunately passed away way too soon. Correct. Yeah. So about two and a half years after he purchased the airplane, uh, passed away unexpectedly uh, through the you know, a wrench in the works for, mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, but yeah, so having a Warbird was a, a lifetime dream of his. And for for better or worse, uh, the A-26 was the airplane that he chose. It was way out of his league, way over his head. Uh, but he was a dreamer. He actually, you know, never painted it on the airplane, but the, his name for the airplane was Dream Come True. Uh, oh. So that was that was kind of his nose art or his idea that you know if he ever reached that stage that was going to be the name of the airplane. So uh, you were you were fourteen when your dad bought the airplane and he would correct. have been just driving when when he perished. Yeah, I was yeah probably about sixteen and a half when he passed away. Um, okay. I was a junior in high school. So tell us what happened to uh, if you can a little bit about what happened to the airplane after your father died. Yeah, so when he we got the airplane home in September of ninety, and really for the next well two and a half years that he was around, he puttered around with it, you know, cleaned it, did little things, ran the engines every once in a while, and was trying to put together a plan of one, what did he had gotten into, and two, what was he going to do with it, you know, as far as what were going to be the steps to make it operational, because it was variable when they brought it out, but. Uh, it was far from being, you know, certified and and airworthy for you know for air show type use. Uh, so when he passed away, the airplane just sat. It continued to sit. It, it had been sitting outside for the for the time that he was around with the aircraft, and it continued to sit. And my mom made some really good decisions. Uh, the first thing she said is, "We're not going to do anything big for the first year." Uh, I have a, a brother who's four years younger, so two young kids at home and. You know, the carpet had been pulled out from under all of our feet. And we we're just trying to get our, our our legs underneath us and figure out what life was going to be like. So she said, we're not going to do anything for a year. Um, no, no big changes. And then uh, shortly afterwards, you know, I was going off to college and kind of out of the loop a little bit. Uh, the airplane was kind of getting pushed around the airport to various parking spots. And there was... Uh, a museum that was kind of up and coming in the area. And they approached my mom and said, hey, what would you think about maybe donating the aircraft and being a part of this, helping us get this museum off the ground? And, and they had a whole cadre of volunteers that had experience and knowledge and enthusiasm. And we thought that's a that's a good place for the airplane to go because it's just gonna melt back into the earth if we if we keep it in our possession. So it was donated to a museum uh, that never really got off the ground. The behind the scenes, there was a lot going on, but never, never really was open to the public. And probably in the early 2000s, so I think the airplane was donated maybe around 97 or 98. Um, and then probably in, by the early 2000s, uh, during the time frame that they had it, they had disassembled it, done a lot of preparation for restoration, some restoration work. They had transported it in pieces from one airport to another, from Everett to Arlington, Washington. Uh, and then the museum kind of fell on hard times, closed their doors, and and that's when some new owners came came along. And uh, at that point, it was 
it was hangered at that point when they when they Correct. took over. Yes. So yeah. the the museum that had it that my mom donated it to, they fairly quickly got it inside. They had a bunch of um they had hangar space donated. They had a lot of parts and pieces donated, labor donated from some local uh, maintenance shops on the field in Everett. And then they had their facility up at Arlington. They disassembled the aircraft, trucked it up there. And then I think by that point, when it was stored in, in their hangar in Arlington, I think that was about when the, the work kind of came to a halt. Your favorite story? Uh, well, just the ferry flight itself, you know, it was so awe-inspiring. My my jaw was on the ground the entire time. You know, it started off, you know, first of all, the, the three of us, my dad, myself, and then Hugh Glassburn, our ferry pilot, um, we we flew, I think we caught a United flight from just Seattle to Chicago, and we took parachutes as our carry-on luggage on a United flight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody... Everybody thought we were crazy, uh, and you know my dad was was a little bit of good crazy. Uh, he was mm -hmm. he was a dreamer. He he thought big. He he did big. He was an engineer. He thought he could do everything himself. He probably could have, but he just didn't have enough time. Um, so yeah, so the ferry flight. You know, I'd never been around any aircraft equipment similar to the A twenty six. You know, I'd been around some small general aviation aircraft, and that was about it. And you know we. Hop in the A26, uh, the first leg, the ferry pilot, he had his parachute strapped on. The second leg, he had his parachute on, but he didn't have it strapped on. He just had it as a seat pad or the you know seat cushion, basically. Yeah, then, because they're not comfortable no, if you don't have something in there. No, not at all. And then by the third leg, I don't think he even had the parachute in the cockpit. So he had he was gaining confidence in the aircraft. So <laughs> great. <laughs> So yeah, it's just the, the whole ferry flight, you know, to be sharing this experience with my dad, you know, in hindsight, it was really, really special, even more, more so after he had passed away. Sure. But I knew at the time it was something really special. Okay. So I've got some uh, vintage photos. I actually put these in a video, uh, one of my earlier videos. I'm just going to put them up here and, and uh if you want to comment on them, that would be great. And you sent me some photos that will be in this montage. Okay. You see that? Uh, it's booting up. There we go. So there it is. And it's probably one of the early standard oil paint schemes. What year would you guess that? Uh, what well, year would you guess this is, Matt? I would guess probably in the mid 50s. Okay. Maybe even early 50s. I can't remember what year standard oil took possession. I think that was probably in the early 50s. Do you think the cowlings are yellow on that, or what would you guess? No, I don't think so. The The aircraft uh, acquired yellow cowlings somewhere later in its life, because the, the airborne picture we have with Junior Birchnall down in Paris, Texas, it had black cowlings. Okay. Okay. Well, because when you got it, it had yellow cowls. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. And standard oil fluid was a single pilot operation? I don't know. No. With... With some of the conversion it had over the years, they relocated the emergency hydraulic hand pump to behind the pilot seat. So I think that essentially made it probably a two-pilot aircraft. Because I don't know if you'd be able to pump the gear down as a single pilot. It would be tough. Well, with the second seat installed, that would be for, for sure a two-pilot uh, two airplane. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so that's that was probably about the time, I don't know, this about the time that my dad uh, was starting to look at the aircraft, so that's at Courtesy Aircraft in Rockford, Illinois, sometime in the late 80s or 1990 time frame. Okay. Uh, 88 here, Rockford, Illinois. Yeah. At, at some sort of air show, I guess. Yeah, so it sat in Rockford from 85 to 90. It had, it had been in San Diego prior to moving to Rockford. Uh, it was purchased by Bob Collings from the Collings Foundation as a kind of a spare aircraft to their needs. And Mark Clark ferried it out in 1985 from San Diego en route to Rockford. They'd changed one engine in San Diego and then en route lost an engine, diverted to Mesa, Arizona, replaced that. And a couple months later, resumed the ferry trip to, um, wow. to Rockford. Okay. Uh, that, that certainly looks different. So, <laughs> Uh, for my viewers, you might notice that this decal is upside down for whatever reason. Uh, Jan made a new decal. It's now 
where you can read it when you're standing up. <laughs> pretty, pretty funny, though. And then this is uh, in-flight refreshments. You could have coffee or water, and this was a Dix Dixie cup dispenser. We still <laughs> have that. Uh, May of 90 when we were there taking a look at the aircraft and kind of doing a, heater. a functional check. Yeah, so a bunch of, bunch of pictures of us with the airplane uh, at Courtesy Aircraft in Rockford, Illinois in 1990. And this is uh, Mark Clark, the guy who sold your dad the airplane. Correct. At Courtesy. Correct. Yeah, Mark Clark is Courtesy Aircraft. Okay. And I've talked with him. He sent me a couple of articles oh, yeah. back in the day. Yeah. N nice enough guy. This is when when you bought it, it had the on-mark conversion nose or what we kind of termed the Pinocchio nose. Correct. And when we got it, that was all gone. Yeah. Yeah, so when my dad purchased the airplane, uh, part of the deal, other than the airplane being made very ready, was that there was also a, a stock six-gun nose that came with it. Uh, you know, the the gun ports were fared over, yeah. but it was the, an original six-gun nose that had the the nose art of Cotton Jenny on it, which mm -hmm. been on one or two other airplanes, including one I believe that had raced at Reno at some point back in yeah. the day. Yeah, I think there's a news article some print somewhere that talks about that yeah um so there's your dad there's my dad. courtesy yeah yeah what a difference yeah so we you know we were back there we were trying to photo document and video document uh everything that we could so that he could reflect in his notes later on so some of these pictures are screen grabs from the video you can kind of see the wavy line through them yep yep especially that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> And there's the famous air stair. Yeah. Uh, tell me your recollections of this thing. So the the air stair, um, the the hydraulic or the electro hydraulic setup on it was not functional for us um, during the inspection and the ferry flight. And I'm not sure if the system was inoperative or if we just didn't have you know power to the certain electrical bus or not. But during the ferry flight, we just tied a rope to the the bottom rung of the steps, and then we would just lay i would lay on my belly and hoist the hatch up and turn the handle to, to latch us in well jan's got that operating like a uh, swiss watch i've it's seen your like, videos it's really cool it is really cool <laughs> and there's a putt putt tell yeah. us about that so i believe that was in the the left nacelle kind of in the the stinger of the nacelle the tail end um it was just probably like a very simple Briggs and Stratton type engine. I remember uh, looking recently through some of my dad's notes that went along with these pictures. And, you know, it appeared that the exhaust or the, the engine just exhausted into the nacelle. There was, there was no port for it to exhaust overboard. Really? Yeah. Because there is a, uh, there is an outboard pipe in the okay. nacelle I, cap. At, at the point that this picture was taken, it was not plumbed to that, uh, exhaust port. Oh, that would have been a drag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, the APU was probably not operative and we certainly didn't try to operate it. So. Okay. Now, this is behind the pilot. This is the nasty hydraulic system. Yeah. Which, which caused us a lot of grief because I think the original plan, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jan, the original plan or Dave's vision for this was to do an extended annual, make it functional uh, mechanically. And then when we got this stuff, well, it was already out, but when we started messing with the center console, four of the pulleys in the back, the only ones I could reach, two of those did not turn. And you spent uh, two days getting those pulleys to turn. And it was that's when we decided that we needed to unbuckle the center console, take it out, refurb the whole thing, paint it. And so then it became a, a much cleaner painter painted airplane than what it would have been if we did followed that course. Was well, that we decided we better go through the whole thing just to make sure every one of the systems and 
Yeah. And all those hydraulic circuits worked because e even all of the uh, the vents, the vent tubes that go out, most of them were plugged. So yeah. if you guys had any problems flying that airplane out or erroneous uh, indication of anything, that would, that would be why yeah. part of it. But we just decided it was too far gone. Couldn't just uh, clean it up and, and uh, keep going. It was we, we decided we had to go clear down with it. Well, yeah. and this hydraulic system had been leaking on the pulleys in the very back. Yeah, and was, that's what it caused the colossal a, mess. Yep. There's a there's a photographer's moment. <laughs> so a 14-year-old photographer put their shadow right across the subject of the photo. <laughs> That's my dad sitting in the cockpit. Yeah. Man, this instrument panel's come a long way. Most of the placards are missing from the throttle quadrant. Yeah. Uh, and there's a big gaping hole. Yes, uh, when we went back to look at the airplane in May of 90, there was a, a gash through the skin there, kind of just underneath the left horizontal. And what had happened was the airplane was being tugged during the winter when the ground was slick. And it, I think the airplane got away from the, the tug driver and it was uh, punctured by a fence post. So by the time we picked up the airplane in September of 90, there was, a, I, I think, a pretty nicely done flush patch. Okay. Yeah, it, it actually looks really good. So, man, I, this must have been scary for you looking at the airplane. I didn't know any better. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, looking back on it with what I know now, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't believe my mom let us go do this. You know? <laughs> the fact that she let us, you know, go hop on an airliner with parachutes to go pick up a an old airplane and fly it across the country was, I mean, it's just wild. She, she was a pretty generous father. and open-minded mother. That's she, for sure. Uh, she is. She's always up for an adventure, but she, I don't <laughs> think she knew what big of an adventure we were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one of the engines. They sure look different now. Yeah. Well, and you know, my recollection is that they ran really well. They ran smooth. The only we had, we had two issues. Uh, one, when we landed in Billings uh, on the, the second leg of the first day. So we had two legs on the first day, one leg on the second day to get the airplane home. We landed in Billings. And from what I've read in the, my dad's notes, the engines loaded up on the runway and quit. So, and so my understanding is you know loaded up mixture wise. Maybe they were running too rich and just flooded themselves out. And according to the notes that we have, we sat on the runway for about five minutes. Uh, there was an airliner inbound and the tower the tower wanted to send a tug out to tug us off the runway. And eventually they were able to get the engines restarted with uh, battery, oh, wow. battery power before we could taxi off. But wow. the, engines, the engines seemed to run fine. Uh, the next day on the leg from Billings to Everett, we were up in cruise and the right engine kind of sneezed and backfired and <coughs> extruded a part of the induction boot out through the, the top of the the cowling or top of the cow flaps. Okay, we're going to come up to that picture. Somewhere we got the video of at least parts of that flight that you had, and I'll try to put it on the channel when I All can right. find it. And uh, yeah, I've got a There's, broken part here. Yeah, so in May of 90, when my dad was kind of doing a systems functional check of the aircraft, I uh, got a ground power cart, electrical power to the airplane, and lowered the flaps and one of the linkages bound up and actually broke a fitting of some sort. So that was replaced for the ferry flight. Is that a pretty loud bang? I it probably was. I don't it's been too long. I don't recall, Jen. So I, you know, I think I know that the uh running the the flaps you got a lot of um flap motor noise. So I don't know if we heard it from in the cockpit. I just don't recall. Oh okay. And so restoring the flaps on this was well, like a five-year journey and then you know when refurbished fortunately they were already recovered and okay. and uh, uh all we had to do was paint them but then we had to do all the hardware all of the uh the uh motors the 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 little transmissions uh, transmissions there's five of them per wing but well, i remember on one of my trips to provo jan i saw you guys had a whole like test stand set up yeah. <laughs> we, did. we built a test stand to check them out yeah 
I mean, that was quite the operation just to. <laughs> well, just and that's a, a that's a far cry from where it was when it was actually on the airplane and operational. Right. And, and even then, it was a two or three week journey just trying to get everything in rig. And right. Jan and Dave were just cussing. I, I don't hear them cuss very often, but. <laughs> and could you those, imagine those that? flaps? They were they were really something to get uh, rigged out. Yeah. Could you imagine when they were just pumping these things out of the factory, though? Holy cow. Oh, geez. Well, they had all the jigs. and Right. And so this is one of the pictures you just sent me. Yeah. So this is a picture that I'm not sure how my dad acquired it or if it came with the aircraft, but uh, stamped on the back of this photo, it says uh, Flying Tigers Air Museum, Paris, Texas, and it had a P.O. box number. So that was Junior Birchenall. Uh, he had a essentially a Warbird school down in Paris, Texas. He had a, I think, his own private dirt or gravel runway. And yeah, you could, this is probably in the 70s, I believe. Uh, you could go and plunk down a chunk of money and go get checked out in a bunch of different Warbirds. Huh. <laughs> I think you said T6 to P38 if you got enough money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, oh, oh, wow. Look at that. So, so this was uh, on the last leg from Billings to Everett. We we did a flyby in Twisp, Washington, which is in north central Washington. And that was where our ferry pilot, Hugh Glassburn, lived. So he, he phoned ahead before we left Billings and had a bunch of his friends out there on the ramp at Twisp. And we did a flyby. So this is uh, in the, the climbing turn after the flyby. But what you're looking at, is the right engine and down the leading edge of the right wing. So just above the top segment of the cowl flap, you can see something sticking out right there, that black. Right piece. here. Yeah. And <clears throat> you know, that's the uh, cowl flap seal that's now out of place. Okay. So yeah. when the engine had sneezed in root and that piece was extruded at that point and was flapping around, and I think it may have actually torn off eventually, or maybe a, another piece had already torn off when this picture was taken. So I just yeah. assumed part of like an induction boot or something or yep yeah yep. and it's split there as well okay. and then you can look down the leading edge of the right wing that was the condition of the boots <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty rotten before we had left rockford illinois uh hugh had me climb up on top of the wing with his pocket knife and cut cut all the loose pieces off you're you a brave kid talking about do you, do you remember anybody talking about roll rate on the airplane was it stiff was it did it respond you okay know, uh, actually, I kept a little diary of during the ferry flight, and I was looking through this yesterday, and I actually mentioned that somewhere in here, and I'd have to look at it, but I, my recollection from what I read of my notes here yesterday was that it was fairly heavy in roll and, and pretty sensitive in pitch. I can see that. Wide. Yeah. That's because you had no uh, boot, no uh, gap seals on the ailerons. Okay, Yeah. But if it makes you feel any better, a B-17 is pretty heavy on the roll. But yeah, I'll tell heavy. you, the, yep. the pitch the pitch is yeah. second exactly to none. Said, Matt. <laughs> Hard on the I've roll got, and easy on the pitch. Yeah, I've gotten to fly the a uh, couple of B-25s a fair amount. And I would say you know, probably pretty similar. Pretty, yeah. pretty long right. pitch, yeah, heavier on the roll. Okay. So we're down to about 10 minutes. So, um, yeah, there's another picture of that same thing. And you see a lot of oil streaming back. You know, during one of the videos, you I had zoomed in. You could see the oil actually dripping off the back of the nacelle in flight. <laughs> oh, right wow. there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So this must be your mom. Yep. So we had just, just parked there in Everett at the conclusion of the ferry flight. My mom met us there with beers for my dad and Hugh. <laughs> and probably some sodas and sandwiches for me. And, and uh, yeah. We were there. She's wondering, oh, my God, what have you just done? And my dad's probably thinking, eh, it just, just concluded a dream. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I so want Matt, those covers. I want those covers. Where yeah, so, I was thinking about that. So, so Matt, I got a question. Yeah. How did the landing gear perform for you? Uh, retract and, and extend. Did they come out okay and go up okay? Yes. I don't recall any abnormalities. Well, so, I have to tell you how lucky you were because I believe it was on the right side. There's a uh, pull, pull pin that pulls the yep lock block out of the way. Yeah. And as we were pulling that out, we broke it. No it kidding. Halfway <laughs> yeah. through and rusted oh, for man. a long, long, long time. 
Uh, yeah. And the other one guys, looked like it was on its way. Yeah. This airplane, I bet if it had five more landings in it before that broke, that was it. Wow. So we're looking yeah, at a picture close. of the of the vintage <laughs> of the vintage interior. And for early 50s, this was probably really, really nice. Oh yeah. I bet yeah. The interior. Yeah. For its day, it was pretty nice. So here's the infamous cylinder that you had to fight to get the air door, the, the stairway up that wasn't working. Yeah. And more interior shots. Man, this was sure daunting when we first saw it. Of course, the interior had already been removed when, when we got the airplane. Right. Um, but it looks a whole lot different. This would have been where the janitorial, the, for the janitorial heater for the cabin would have been, and this would have been a toilet seat. Um, and then there's a crawl through up to the cockpit. Yeah. And there's a young kid <laughs> has no idea what he's got himself into. That's right. Oh man. And we're working on the brakes right now. Uh, been a minute. That looks so different now. And that, uh, this was scary when we took Pretty the landing gear out. Yep. Oh, wow. And this was when you said this is when you were in Billings for a refuel. Uh, that was the first stop in Rapid City. Oh, I see. Okay. And that's that's Hugh up there, I guess. Correct. Yeah, Hugh Glassburn was the ferry pilot. No. Okay. Did he fly from the right seat then? No, he, Hugh Hugh flew from the left seat the entire time. Oh, I'm just curious. And here's some. Uh, in flight photos yeah. on the journey. That's your dad sitting in the right yeah. seat. My dad in the right, Hugh in the left. So this would probably either be the second or the third leg because it looks like Hugh does not have his parachute strapped on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. And then and this is where it was at, went to the museum and they were they were actually working on it. Correct. So that would have been probably late 90s when they were starting to disassemble it and get it kind of prepped for restoration. Wow. Yep. Propellers have come off the back end. It looks very much the same, only cleaner and brighter back there <laughs> under the the uh, left wing root. Yeah, more. And, and actually, this doesn't look too bad in the tail compared to this. Right. It's a big old hole in the fuselage. It's seeped off in the rain. Oh. And a lot of, lot of uh, rain had fallen through the all of the control surfaces. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh man, what a difference that uh, uh, 10 years makes on that. Yeah, that's just <laughs> painful to look at. Yep. <laughs> Yippers, there's pop. And that's the end of my slideshow. Well, anything, Matt, that you'd like to, to uh, add? Well, I just, I'm so thankful one to still be associated with the aircraft, you know, whether, you know, I'm kind of a long physical distance away from the aircraft, but I still feel such a tight and close connection to it. And I'm so thankful to to Dave and Jan and you, Bob, for, for keeping me in the loop and letting me be a small part of it. I'm just so happy. My, you know, my whole family is excited that yeah. this airplane's in the correct hands. It's where it should have been all along. Well, I, I think we're really grateful for you because your your dad probably saved it for a from a less wonderful life. It, it it's amazing where we've gotten to since Dave acquired the airplane in 2011. Yeah. It was kind of slow going at first, but the snowball's coming down the hill. <laughs> we, we've got lots going on. So, uh, thanks for for appearing on my channel okay. and uh hope to see you in salt lake soon so you can actually i can take another picture of you sitting in the cockpit i'm looking for <laughs> that would be great that yeah. would really be good that would be awesome <laughs> all right you guys uh, thanks for joining us and uh for those of you watching at home uh please like the video share it out if you haven't subscribed do it um and watch for the next episode of 
us getting this airplane back in the air sometime soon. Thanks for watching. <laughs> With my cell phone on, I get reverb. Yeah, now we don't have to listen to Bob. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, we need somebody to run the Zoom meeting. You did a great service for us here. We're really appreciative of you. What's your shirt size? Uh, probably a large. Okay. I'm wearing an extra large. All right. But but Dave, I've got to come and earn my shirt. I can't just, I just can't get a, a restoration oh, volunteer it. shirt and, and you put have it, earned it without earning it. So. You have earned it. <laughs> You've got, you, you earned it, Matt. So yeah. <laughs> Is that the, that's your camera. <laughs>